Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 310. You must be the person you have never had the courage to be. Gradually, you will discover that you are that person. But until you see this clearly, you must pretend and invent. Palo Coelho. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Black Box. Black Box is a new platform and community that is all about financial freedom for filmmakers like you. If you join Blackbox, you will be transformed from being a worker to being a maker of your own content, and you'll be making steady passive income from the global market. Blackbox currently allows you to upload your stock footage once, get it to many global agencies, and then allows you to share that passive income stream with your collaborators. Whether you want to submit old footage that's been sitting around in your hard drives or create brand new content, Blackbox is for you. It's really quite revolutionary. With Blackbox, filmmakers can concentrate on making great content while Blackbox takes care of all the business BS. Just visit www.blackbox.global to find out more. And today's show is also sponsored by Indie Film Hustle TV, the world's first streaming service dedicated to filmmakers, screenwriters, and content creators. If you want access to filmmaking documentaries, feature films about filmmaking, interviews with some of the top screenwriters and filmmakers in Hollywood, as well as educational online courses all in one place, IFH TV is for you. Just head over to IndieFilmHustle.tv. Now, before we start, guys, I want to apologize for last week that I only put out two podcasts. I know one for Bulletproof Screenplay and one for a throwback for the, the podcast, and I have a good excuse. I was sick. I mean, sick as a dog for about five days with fever in bed. The hustle slowed down. Even even I was taken down by the sickness. So today I have a special episode for you to make it up for you. And that's why it's being launched on Monday because I wanted to give it to you a little bit early this week. Now, also before we start, I have some big, 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 big news. I put out a poll on Facebook and Twitter asking the tribe if they would be interested in going to kind of like a live event for Indie Film Hustle, like, you know, kind of an event with speakers and things like that. And the response was uh, almost unanimous. You guys definitely want to see something like that. And I will be working on something like that coming up this year. I don't know when, I don't know where, but I will be working on it. So stay tuned for that. But until then... I will be having a very special event, a live event, which is a screening, actually the North premiere, the North American premiere of On the Corner of Ego and Desire, which will be screening at the world-famous Chinese theater in Hollywood, April 25th at 7 p.m. Now, we will have Q&A afterwards with the cast, the crew, and everybody involved. Uh, which is not a long list, but a very powerful list of all the people that worked with me on that project. And uh, we'll be able to to sit there and answer any questions you like. And then as a special bonus, I am going to be doing a talk, about a 30 to 45 minute talk on my new book, Shooting for the Mob, in a different area, different theater. And uh, you'll be invited to do that as well. And afterwards, you'll be able to purchase the book and I'll be doing book signings and of course, a little Q&A after that talk about not only about my story and, and and what happened in the book, but also some of the things that happened to me and, and how we can kind of help each other uh, break through some fears of making your fe- your first feature, changing your mindset and things like that. I'm going to go deep in this talk and I really, really am excited about it. So it's April 25th at 7 p.m., starting at 7 p.m. And if you want tickets, just head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash screening. And it is going to be part of the Holly Shorts monthly screening series. My boys over at Holly Shorts have helped me set this thing up. So I'm very, very grateful for that. And they do have screenings every month, films and all sorts. But this month is going to be Ego and Desire at 7 p.m., followed by my talk on shooting for the mob and book signing. And books will be available for purchase at the event. 
So please, if you're in the LA area, I want you guys to come out. I want the tribe to come out. We've got a big theater. I want to fill it all up. And I really want to get uh, you guys to see finally on the corner of Ego and Desire. Now, today's episode is about faking it till you make it. And I've kind of touched upon this in the, on, in the past on the podcast, but I really wanted to kind of go into the weeds a little bit today with you guys on it because there's a lot of misconceptions about how to do it, when to do it, when to do it right. I know a lot of people out there say it's a horrible piece of advice. Don't ever fake it till you make it. You can really do a lot of damage, all this kind of stuff. And I want to kind of set the record straight and and also just kind of give you a, a kind of a small blueprint on how to do it properly. And I also give you some examples of people in our business as well as my own experiences Uh, by faking it till you make it. Now, why would you fake it till you make it? You fake it because you don't have opportunities, because you don't have opportunities or access to things that you just wouldn't be able to get any other way. And I'll give you a perfect example. My editorial reel. When I was first coming up, I got a job working at the largest production company in the Southeast at the time. And we did a lot of big commercials and and, uh, music videos and things like that. And I was just a young kid right out of school. I must have been 21, I think, at the time, 20 or something like that. And I didn't have any other access to another any other opportunities other than just basically being a tape dubber and or PA on the weekends for this production company. Then slowly but surely, I started learning the editing system, the Avid, which is right next door to me. And little by little, I learned how to edit, and I was really excited about it, and I, was, and I found I had a good talent for editing. But the kind of footage that I had access to made it look like, you know, I was kind of what I was, a starting out editor. Now, my skill set was much far beyond what the access of footage that I had or, or what my reel showed, and that's a mistake so many young editors and young filmmakers in general make is that they... They put out exactly what they have access to. So if they go out and shoot shorts on the weekends or, you know, film, you know, film some fake commercials with or something with their friends. And you can just tell it's not high end. It's not really, you know, fully, you know, seasoned or polished. And uh, when you go out for a job, you lose out because other editors uh, are more experienced and they have better reels. They've worked with bigger clients and uh, bigger companies. And, and, you know, people want to feel safe when they're hiring people. Now, I know for a fact that I saw a lot of editors come in and out of my production office and the ones that had those kind of reels never saw the light of day, regardless of how talented they might have been. So one day an opportunity arose. We had just acquired uh, about four or five different directors over from Europe and a ton of footage came over from that uh, from that buy or, or that acquisition of directors for representation by my production company. So I saw this this just wealth of raw footage and commercials and logos and music and all this kind of stuff. So I decided without anyone's permission, without anyone's knowing, I just started grabbing that footage and digitizing it into the Avid. And I started seeing commercials. So I saw raw footage dailies for these huge multi-million dollar commercials but they were all European. So it it kind of was amazing because it wasn't like I was taking David Fincher's Nike commercial and re-editing it and saying, hey, I was the editor on this. I was taking European footage that nobody in the States really had seen before, but it was super high quality stuff. So I just started to put together commercials, fake spec commercials. We like to call them speculation commercials. So I would start editing these commercials and some of them were like, you know, sports drinks and shoes, you know, you know, sneakers and other things like that, really big brands, um, but European again. So what I started to do is just take the, that footage, edit together, and I would slap a Nike logo at the end of it. And I was like, hey, yeah, I did. that's a Nike commercial. And I would grab some amazing music that was just awesome and just put it in there and just edit it, man. And I just went for it. And it was, again, a different time. There was no internet uh There was internet, but there was no demo reels. You couldn't upload anything. So everything was still on VHS tapes at the time, VHS and three-quarter inch tapes. DVDs weren't even around at that moment in time. Uh, So what I did is I started putting together a demo reel. And I put together a bunch of reels, a bunch of commercials, maybe like like five or six commercials, all of them with 
raw footage from these these commercials and I just said, hey, this is my demo reel. And then I went out into the marketplace as a freelance editor based on that demo reel. And if anyone ever asked me, to ask me the question, you know, did you, you know, who did you work for? I'm like, I wouldn't lie. I would just say, oh, those are spec commercials. But the talent was seen. And then all of a sudden, the quality that I was able to grab from all of that um, kind of footage gave me a tremendous, gave me a, a leg up in the marketplace. And there was just nobody in my area down in Miami at the time that was uh, doing that kind of work. So all of a sudden, I mean, it's literally the very first interview I did, I got a, a job as a freelancer and started doing commercials for, you know, the local major league baseball team, the Marlins and all this kind of stuff. Why? Because of this speculation commercial, this fake commercial uh, reel that I put together. Now I did all the work. I did everything myself, so I was capable of doing it. And that's the big key here, guys. I was faking it till I made it, but the thing was I was capable with the skill set at that time to be able to fake it. I wasn't faking something that I had no idea how I was ever going to be able to do or you know, promising something to this client that I wasn't able to bring to the table. And that's where people get caught up and that's where mistakes are made. If I would have literally stolen uh edited commercials by some other editor somewhere else and i was barely you know work, being able to run around or work in avid at that time and said yeah yeah i edited those i edited those and then you get put in front of a client that's when your entire career locally you know i would have i would have never been hired again the word would have gotten out like this alex kid is a bser and he's not good and done i would my career would have been done so you see the difference between fake it till you make it and then fake it till you make it. I have no idea how I'm going to get there. I already knew that I could do the job. I just needed just a little something to kind of crack that door open. It was start. It was the beginning of the hustle, if you will. And that was a great, great example of it. And by the way, I did not. I barely updated my reel. Those those spots stayed on my demo reel probably for about five years. Like I, I did not remove them because they were, they did so well for me. People still, you you know, called me on it. Even after I had done probably four or 500 commercials and promos and things over the years, I would slowly replace them little by little, but I loved them so much and they did so well for me. So now all of a sudden I had a reel of a lot of, uh, I had a demo reel of a bunch of real spots that I had been working on and then a couple of speculation spots. So no one even asked me anymore after a while because I already had the credibility for it. And it's just a way that I, I got my way up and I started working as an editor and I was making really, really insane money back in the mid 90s because of fake it till you make it. Another great example is Robert Rodriguez. Now, you know, guys, I, I love talking about Robert on the show. I'm a big fan of Robert and and everything he's done. But early in his career, what he did with El Mariachi uh, he did a, a little bit of element of fake it till you make it, which was this. He was able to take a existing trailer. So he took a, a movie trailer for whatever big movie there was at the time. And it, and that specifically at that time, they didn't have any voiceover. So all it was, it was just music and action. So he took the music track off of a VHS, basically literally just dubbed it off of a VHS. And in that track you would hear the New York Times says this is amazing oh blow your butt off Roger Eber gives it four stars and all these kind of review style uh reviews on on the track so you have this driving crazy music with these you know professional voice over a uh, guy t uh giving amazing reviews and he cut a trailer for El Mariachi using that track and he put it out on his on his VHS with a, his short film and showed it to the potential agent and other people. And people went crazy for it. Why? Because it created a different kind of light to El Mariachi. You know, El Mariachi was a very low budget indie film, you know, but he wanted to create this kind of impression or image of a big blockbuster action movie. And by fake it till you make it, he did. And even if people know, even professionals who watched that trailer knew that that was not real, that, 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 that those reviews weren't real, 
it didn't matter. They are, that, that already clicked into their head and they already started associating it with a big budget uh, blockbuster. But the visuals that he was able to create in El Mariachi were able to hold the weight of what he was trying to do. So that's another great example of fake it till you make it. Now, there's another story about an Academy Award winning producer by the name of Brian Grazer. That's Ron Howard's producing partner and uh, co-founder of Imagine Entertainment. And when he was starting out, he actually just got uh, an internship at Warner Brothers working in the business affairs department, basically just running mail. You know, he was a runner. But what he did was, it was very ingenious back in the day. He started calling all around town saying, hi, I'm Brian Grazer. I work in the business affairs department at Warner Brothers. And he started pitching ideas. He started to take meetings around town because he, and anyone called at the business affairs department, he would be there to pick up. And it was an ingenious way because it opened up doors that wouldn't have been open to him. So by the time they caught on to this situation, I think he was there a year before he was fired. But by then he had already sold two ideas to NBC for $5,000 each. And he got his career started. Now, why would you do that if you you know if you're starting out because Brian didn't have any other ac- access he didn't have any other opportunities presented to him if he would have called up somebody said hey I'm the mailboy over at this Warner Brothers business affairs they would have hung up the phone on him so it's it was it was a little bit of a stretch <laughs> and that wasn't a stretch it was a it was a full lie but the way you presented it gave him the opportunities that get, that got him to where he is today. Another very, very, very famous story that's actually mythology at this point, and I don't even know if it's real or not, but I'm going to tell it anyway, is Steven Spielberg. The, the way the, the, the story goes is that Steven Spielberg uh, got to, uh, to L.A. and he went on the Universal Studios uh, backlot ride. And during the ride, uh, he jumped out. He jumped out when they were in the, in, in the back studio somewhere. So then he would – he ran somewhere – and found an empty office somewhere on the lot, and he set up shop. He literally, he had a phone there, he he would come every day, and how he would set himself up, like back in the day, obviously the security was a little bit more lax in the 70s, early 70s, late 60s, early 70s. So he, he would just wave, he would dress the part, so he would dress with a suit, and, 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 and he would come with a briefcase, and nobody would question him. He would just wave to the security guard and like, hey, Henry. And he would just walk right by. And he did that for months. And while he was there, he started calling around town, making appointments, talking to people, and trying to, to make deals. While he was at Universal, he's like, yeah, I'm at the Universal lot and all this kind of stuff. So it's similar to the Brian Grazer story, but that's how he got his start. And... You know, he had a, he had a short film and he had directed a bunch of stuff already. And, you know, look, when I mean a bunch of stuff, short films, and he that was the way he got his opportunity. And then Sid Sheinberg uh, discovered him and gave him a gave him a contract, a seven year contract for a, I think a twenty year old or twenty two year old or twenty three year old or something like that. Uh, I think it was a twenty year old actually because uh, he had a seven year TV contract with Universal. And he was able to direct, and he was the youngest director ever to get that. But it all started off because he was faking it till he made it. Now, did Spielberg have the goods? He had a lot of goods, I'm sure, at that point. But things that he didn't know, he knew he would have to learn before he before the time was up. And I have another story, another great example of that with myself. While I was editing, and, and you know, in my early career, I was offered a job at a big agency, a freelance job at a large marketing agency. And they wanted to bring in an Avid and some visual effects machines and things like that to do this big campaign. This is when, you know, campaigns were really expensive, even at the lower levels. And they had the money, like money was just flowing. It was the nineties. What are you going to do? But I was, I was brought in and they wanted to know if I could do some high end visual effects uh, for the, you know, for these commercials, which was, I think it was, I think it was like a hockey team mixed with uh, the local 
car dealership, but it was a big budget. It was a big budget and a big sponsorship with the, the Florida Panthers, if I remember correctly. And I said, absolutely, not a problem at all. And they were, it was something that I would have to do in After Effects, Adobe After Effects. And at that, at that time in my career, I knew a little bit about it, but the stuff they were asking for was pretty high end. So I said, yes, and then started to learn as much as humanly possible. And thank God that back then, at those times, it took forever for anything to get done. So I had just hours and days and, and some actually weeks to teach myself the tools needed for that job. Now, I really stretched the fake it till you make it idea back then, but I was able to do it. And it worked and, and the client was very happy and I was able to work with them more and more in the future. But that was a great uh, example of fake it till you make it. Now, I want to be very clear with this whole concept of fake it till you make it. When you are doing this, what you're doing is you're leading others to believe that without a shadow of a doubt, without question, find the answer, even though you don't have it right now. You will become the person for the job, even though you aren't that person at the moment they're hiring you. That is the difference between fake it till you make it. You are leading people to believe that you're able to not only do that job, but that you are guaranteeing them that before the time comes, you will educate yourself and get what needs to be done, done. And that's where people fail. And that's where people make mistakes by faking it till you make it. When you lie to somebody about your capabilities and then don't do the work to raise your capabilities up to the job or the task at hand, that is where this blows up in your face. So be very, very careful that you are it, it, in very much inside of you know that you're going to be able to do that. When I was able to uh, put my spec demo reel out there with you know, presenting myself as I was a big editor working with these big clients, I already knew that I was going to be able to bring the goods as an editor. I just needed a leg up. I needed something to open the doors for me. And that's what that did for me. And I did that throughout my career, including, I mean, it's just, it's constant. You always fake it till you make it wherever you are in your career and wherever you are in your life. You know, you always have to do stuff like that to just project a certain image out there of, of something that you're able to do. And if you don't know how to do it at that moment, you need to learn how to do it and make sure you you know, comply to whatever you told people that you are going to do. Anyone can fake it. And in many ways, faking it is how you get the door open. The question is whether you're taking the time to learn and grow as well. So when the door does open, you're ready and you've made it. You're ready to go. Now, I hope this episode helped you guys out a little bit, inspired you a little bit about faking until you make it because I know a lot of uh, of the members of the tribe out there are not in LA and they're out somewhere else in the world in a small, a smaller country, smaller markets, even here in the U S and, you know, smaller, con- uh, small, smaller cities that don't have a lot to do with the film industry and the opportunities are more scarce. And the concept of faking it till you make it does help, uh, dramatically in getting yourself out there and getting yourself opportunities that wouldn't be there before. Great ways of faking it till you make it is, creating a website, presenting yourself as a professional, putting yourself out there, making yourself look like you've already there, that you're already doing what you're supposed to be doing and that you're already there and you're just another client. That's what so many people do, but you've got to make sure you bring the goods with you. You've got to make sure that you have the skills to back up that that uh, belief, that um, that image that you're putting out there. If there's an actor that is uh, working, uh, is trying to get themselves out there into the world, and let's say he or she is living in a, a studio apartment somewhere in Van Nuys here in California, but when they go out at night or they go to different mixers or events, they're not dressed like you know a broke actor. They're dressed differently. They have different you know clothes on. They have different personas on. And they start putting themselves out there in different ways and different events and things. So when people see them, they're like, hey, you look like someone who should be an actor. Or, hey, 
I'm looking for an actor. Here's here's my card. Give me a call because of the the image that they're putting out there. They're not dressed like they are at home in shorts and t-shirts, looking broke like we all did at the beginning. They're putting out an image, and that image is a fake it till you make it kind of image. So you have to understand that and always dress for success wherever you go in life. Always dress the part. Always act the part. Even though you might not be doing it right now, you should be acting the part and feeling the part and looking the part. I'm not saying show up to the – please. I, I got to say this. I got to say this. If you're a director and you show up to the set of any set with the word director on your T-shirt on the front or the back, you should be taken out and beaten. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry I had to say it. That That's just so – ridiculous. No professional director will ever do that. Same thing goes for cinematographer. Same thing goes for sound guy. Same thing goes for anybody. No professional comes out with a shirt that says, especially at the higher, you know, you know, the director, the producer, things like that. So don't do it. So when you, when I'm saying project yourselves as someone who's already doing it, that's what you need to do. But Make sure you bring the goods, or if you don't have the goods or you don't have the knowledge, at that moment, educate yourself quickly on that process and get the job done. I hope this episode's helped out a little bit in this whole concept of fake it till you make it, and uh, it's been instrumental in my life and instrumental in so many people's lives in this business. I can't even tell you. Every big director that you've ever probably heard of has done an element or two of fake it till you make it. So thank you guys for listening. If you haven't already, please head over to shootingforthemob.com. It is actually officially going to be released tomorrow, April 2nd. So it is finally the release of Shooting for the Mob. So I'm going to put out a special episode uh, tomorrow just talking about that and, and announcing that. So please, this is what I need you guys to do. Head over to shootingforthemob.com. Buy the book on Tuesday morning as soon as you can because I need to get as many orders as possible on one or two you know, few hours and that will boost me up into the number one spot in Amazon and that would help sales dramatically and help the book get out there and so on, guys. So I need your help. So please head over to shootingforthemob.com. That takes you straight to Amazon and you can buy the book there. Please read it. And if you have read the book, and I know a bunch of you have, I need you to leave a review ASAP. But I'll talk to you more about all of this stuff tomorrow in a special kind of side episode of Indie Film Hustle. So I appreciate it, guys. Thank you again so, so much. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E dot com.